I've been uh, given the privilege to talk to you about creativity and innovation in the mission. We've been talking about the mission these last few days, and so I, I've been asked to talk about creativity and innovation in the mission. Look, let me be honest. I, I get asked to talk about this quite often, uh, not just in uh, my city, not just in South Africa, uh, but I get to travel to many places, and they're always asking, Onde, could you come and talk to us? Could you share uh, about creativity and innovation in the mission? Now, let me give you a couple of reasons why I think people ask me to come and talk about this. Uh, like Pastor Femi just mentioned, uh, we seven years ago, we just turned seven. So seven years ago, uh, my wife and I got the opportunity, uh, the privilege, by God's grace, to plant a church in the city of Pretoria, the birthplace of apartheid. We planted a gospel-centered, disciple-making, transcultural community. Now, a lot of you would go, gospel-centered, amen, yes. If you love Jesus, then you must be gospel-centered. Disciple-making, 100%. We are called to make disciples. But what is transcultural? It sounds familiar, but it's also different. A little bit like multicultural. So is it the same? And, and so we say yes and no. Let me give you the definition of transcultural. It is a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context, and by the power of the gospel, transcends it to create a new community. This is Ephesians 2 language, where Paul says that the gospel, Jesus, his death and resurrection has demolished the dividing wall of hostility. That dividing wall of hostility that existed between humanity and God, and then by implication, between you and me. And so in the city of Pretoria, in South Africa, with the history that we have, as we page through the scriptures, we see that God is forming a family for himself from all people. Let me say that to you again. God is forming a family for himself from all people. And so who are we to decide, well, I'm just going to gather with these group of people who look like me, think like me, vote like me. And so we trusted God to establish a transcultural community. Now, that required a lot of creativity and innovation. If decade after decade after decade, people had, had believed the lie that, that we are meant to gather together with people who look like us, we had to think differently. And by God's grace, he's established that community. And we've now multiplied. We've gotten the opportunity to plant two churches that we sent out last year who carry the same heart to say we want to be gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. So, so maybe that's one of the reasons people will ask me to come and speak on creativity and innovation. Maybe it's because in our Sunday gatherings, we have this thing that we call question of the day. Let me explain to you question of the day. We uh, gather, uh, we sing a few songs, much like many of your churches. There's a few announcements. And then before the sermon is preached, someone will come up and say, it's time for question of the day. Now you can imagine people who are familiar with a Sunday gathering would go, what on earth is this? And then that person will then explain what question of the day is. They say, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to answer it so that you get an idea of what we are looking for. And then you must break up into small groups, threes and fours, and then you must answer that question with one another. Now, you can imagine how awkward this is. It's already awkward that I've showed up for someone who is not a Christian or someone who is a Christian but hasn't been gathering with the local church. You can imagine this is awkward. I wanted to simply come in, sit down, sing a few songs, hear a sermon, and then go home. But now you're telling me to turn around and move my chair. What on earth is going on? And, and on top of that, we say you must be in a group with someone that you don't know or don't know that well. Even more awkward. And these questions, they're not theological questions. 
It's not what is eschatology or ecclesiology. No, 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 no. It's questions like if you started a band, what would you call it? Or, or maybe when you, when you were growing up, what were some of your favorite foods? See, we do this because we believe that God has beautifully designed us for fellowship. That we were never meant to live in isolation. That even in a local church, people can believe that, that I've been designed to live on my own. But we were made for one another. And so we created this to establish community, to nurture fellowship. And we've seen some beautiful things. Friendships that have been developed. Now all of a sudden it's like, oh, you like that food? I also like that food. You named your band, what, what, that's crazy. Why would you do that? Oh, let's talk a little bit more about that. We've seen how that fellowship has continued long after the gathering. Now it's awkward, it's unconventional, but we do it. It adds an extra 10, 12 minutes to the gathering, but we do it. In fact, we actually stopped it during COVID because we had to social distance. When we started gathering, it wasn't too long before people were saying, uh, on a, where, when, when are we doing the question of the day? When, uh, when, when, not, hey, what sermon series are we in? How can we be discipling people? What can, no, no, when are we doing question of the day? I want to ask questions about my favorite drink. Maybe that's why they asked me to speak about creativity and innovation. Maybe I'll give you one more. Maybe it's because as a church, uh, we started this thing a couple of years ago called Eat and Run. Now, before you think, what, are you eating and you're running? No, that's not what it is. Eat and run is where you get together with people for a meal in three different locations with three different groups of people. Let me explain. On a Saturday in the evening towards the night, you, you will have a starter a main, and a dessert. So someone, my wife and I will go, we will host a starter at our house. Pastor Femi and Tosin will go, we will host a main, and then someone will go, we will host a dessert. And so we have a number of people that do that. And then we just say, invite your friends, invite your family members, invite your neighbors, invite your colleagues. I mean, already it's an interesting concept. Wait, you, you're doing what? And so we break them up into groups, and then one group will start at our house for starters, maybe another group at another house for starters, another group at another house for starters, and then we'll eat together, and we'll fellowship, and we'll get to know each other, and then we'll go, okay, at a certain time, everybody needs to leave. And so we all get in vehicles, and those who don't have cars get in another vehicle with someone else, and then they drive to another location with a completely diff different group of people. And you get together for a main and then you sit and you engage and you're like, where were you for starters? Where were you? Do you know what I mean? Let's say, this is incredible. This is, this is amazing. And, and the first time we did it, I, I believe we hosted a dessert. So we were the last group of people. So people came to our place. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was so much fun. So much fun that it went well into the evening, into the early morning. And I still had to preach a sermon that Sunday. But there I was, mingling with people, with non-Christians and believers and people who weren't part of a local church. It was incredible. And so at the end of that, you can just say, hey, we're a local church that gathers in the city. You're more than welcome to come. We're not as crazy as you think. We love to hang out with one another and eat good food and talk about Jesus. So, so maybe, maybe that's why they asked me to come and speak about creativity and innovation. But dear friends... I'm here to make a confession. The gig is up. I, I believe the expression here is Yawa Dongas. <laughs> I'm here to tell the truth. Pastor Femi, I'm sorry. I'm not as creative and innovative as you think. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 19 says this, that there is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing new under the sun. And so, and so let, let me uh, confess to you that what I actually do is I 
collaborate. You see, in the academic world, if you copy from someone else, it's called plagiarism. And please don't do it. Don't, don't. <laughs> um, it's being recorded, don't do that. Don't, don't plagiarize. But when we're talking about the mission of God, if I come to Lagos and, and I see something that you guys are doing and I go, wow, this is brilliant. I want to take it back home and contextualize it so that it fits my context. That's not plagiarism. That's kingdom collaboration. And, and I want you to know that I am a collaborator. I am always collaborating. Like what's been happening here? I'm taking notes. I'm taking, I'm collaborating. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. And so when we think about creativity and innovation on mission, we need to recognize that God himself is creative and innovative. That as the church, we, we press into who God is and, and what comes out is this creativity and innovation from God himself who has always been on mission. But just in case you don't believe me, let's work through some definitions in scripture. Creativity. Creativity. What, what does this mean? I looked, looked it up. And I got this definition, it's to bring something into existence. The use of imagination or original ideas to create something. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that everything that we see has been created by God. God is creative. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 says this, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. John chapter 1 verse 3, God created everything through him, speaking of Jesus, and nothing was created except through him. Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Genesis 1, 26. This is the, the grand creation of God. Was who? Was us. That in everything that we see, it blows our minds. I mean, scientists are, are, are learning so much more about the ever-expanding universe. The Bible tells us that the greatest creation by God was us. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Nothing else has been made in God's image. Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God is the designer and architect of everything in the universe. He is the creator. And he created human beings a step above all the rest of creation. And he did that by breathing into the nostrils of man. Do you know how beautiful that is? Think about it for a moment. That the first thing that man saw when he opened his eyes was the face of God. I believe this is why in John chapter 14 verse 8, Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father and that will be enough. That our mission could be simplified as this. We just want people to see the Father. And that'll be enough. This is why Jesus says, if you, if you see me, you see the Father. This is why we put Jesus on display. He created the man and the woman in his own image, which means that human beings are more like God than any other created thing. Yeah. Now, now, I didn't say we are God. I didn't say that. 
I said, we are like God. Therefore, possessing the ability to create. If God creates, then we possess the ability to create. Then we ourselves are creative. But we must remember that anything that we come up with, God gave to us. So whatever great idea you have, before you go, hey guys, let me tell you. Let me tell you about this great, like, creative idea that I have come up with. It's my idea and I own it. Be careful. Because God is standing behind you and going, well, who gave you that idea? We are and can be creative as the local church. The people of God cannot, hear me, the people of God cannot and should not ever be boring. How? How? Okay, Pastor Femi wants it again, I'll I'll do it again. The people of God cannot and should not ever be boring. And yet somehow we've been labeled as that in society. I wonder why. I wonder why. But let's move on. That's creativity. What about innovation? It sounds like a business term. Or now you're giving us a business seminar. No, no. Even in the Bible, we find innovation. A definition that I simply pulled up on on innovation is this. To make changes in something established, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. To put it simply, To be innovative is to be able to think outside the box. And no one is more outside the box than God. I mean, it was an outside the box reality that saved humanity from the pits of sin, death, and Satan. Adam and Eve in their disobedience opened the door to the kingdom of darkness. But God... Oh, but God, in infinite wisdom and mercy, developed a what? An innovative plan to save the world. Throughout history, God has continually used innovative methods to accomplish his purposes. Let me give you a few examples. As the earth continued to fill with the wickedness of humanity, God, rather than destroy the entire human race, told Noah to build an ark. Something that had never been seen before. And and we're so so used to these stories, we just read right past them. Failing to recognize that Noah has been asked to build an ark. Imagine, every day, people walking past this man and his family and going, Hey, chief, what are you doing? (laughs) No, I'm I'm, I'm building an ark because... uh, God's going to flood the earth, and if you come, you'll be saved. But if you stay, you won't. Sorry, say what? Had never been seen before, but it's God's innovative plan. Why? To save as many as were willing to become children of God, to, to enter into this ark, to be obedient to God. Let me give you another one. As wickedness began to rise again, Once more, God intervened, this time by creating multiple languages, leading people to scatter across the earth. That's that's God doing that. We we sometimes sit and we're like, I mean, Africa, the most diverse continent in the world, over 3,000 ethnicities. It all flows from God. To ensure his plan of salvation would move forward, God promised Abraham, he would raise up a nation through him. Through this old man and old woman, he has this plan. And then when Abraham and Sarah decided to innovate outside of God's plan, the results were disastrous. Which is important to hear that that yes, we're called to innovate, but not outside of God's plan in his plan, in what he has called us to do. And so when Abraham and Sarah decided to obey, then success followed. When some of the sons of Jacob, filled with hatred and jealousy, 
They sold their younger brother Joseph into slavery. God's innovative plan took what was meant for evil and turned it into something good. Do you see it? Later, as a new pharaoh wanted to wipe out God's people, God intervened through an innovative yet simple way through a baby floating on a basket. (coughs) Friends, I'm telling you, we, we read these things too quickly. And they become so common to us that we no longer see the beautiful, innovative ways that God is saving humanity. I could go on and on and on because the list goes on and on and on. Water from a rock, walls crumbling by simply marching around them, a giant killed by a young boy with a stone and sling. These are but a few of God's innovative ways of intervening in the wickedness of man. And each one more creative and more innovative than the one before. But the most amazing one, the most amazing one, was when a baby born to a teenage girl was placed in a humble manger And as the story goes, that baby would grow to become a man and that man would be nailed to a cross and he would save humanity once and for all. Isaiah 43 verse 19 says this, Look, I am about to do something new. Remember the definition of innovation? Right there in Isaiah 43 verse 19. Look, I am about to do something new. See, the coming of Jesus to earth is the new thing Isaiah's prophetic words are pointing to, Jesus himself. In fact, Jesus goes on to say in Luke chapter 20, verse 22, after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Friends, God became a man, lived the life we should have lived, died the death we deserve, poured out his blood for you and me for the forgiveness of sins and to be reconciled to the Father, rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the Father, and one day he will return to make all things new. Friends, we say this is the gospel. And it's so creative and so innovative that God would do it this way. God could have done it any other way. He could have literally snapped his fingers and it would be done. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. But, but he doesn't. We get this, this beautiful story that, that should amaze us every time we hear it. And if it doesn't, then we should ask the question, are we doing something wrong? Has it no longer captivated our hearts? then our our prayers should be different. We should be praying, God, would you awaken our hearts to the wonder of who you are? Otherwise, this is just another job. It's just another thing that we do. Oh, Sunday's coming, okay. Make sure the band is ready. Make sure all the leaders are in place. Do we have the curriculum? No, 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 no. Jesus died for us. And he rose from the grave. But before ascending to heaven, Jesus promised his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit. Promising power to be witnesses. Where? Acts 1.8. In Jerusalem. In Judea. In Samaria. And to the ends of the earth. Friends, this is what we've been talking about this whole week. That by grace, God has called us to be a part of this mission. Now, quick side note. In Acts chapter 1, 8, he he says, I want you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I love Jesus. I love Jesus because he he will never call us to do something that he himself has not done. This is one of the reasons that we can trust him. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Do you know that in John chapter 2 to chapter 4, we see Jesus having an impact in all four of those areas? Again, if you read too quickly, you'll miss it. In John chapter 2, he goes to Jerusalem. He goes to the temple. 
sees people selling stuff. He kicks them out. He's like, what's, what's wrong with you? You've, you've, you've made my father's house be- a, 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 a den of thieves. So he sorts out the temple, the then house of God, Jerusalem. We jump over to John 3, and we've heard it a few times, where he has a conversation with a man called Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He, he was part of the Sanhedrin, and at that time, the Sanhedrin had a lot of influence in where? Judea. So he's having impact with a person who has influence in an area called Judea. Fast forward, we get to Jesus now engaging a woman from Samaria, a Samaritan woman. Living water, and it's it's such such a beautiful, beautiful engagement that happens there. She goes back to her town, massive impact. And then what does the end of John 4 say? Let, Let me... Let's read it together. John 4, it's not up on the screen, but I'll read it to you. John chapter 4. Here's how that whole encounter ends. Verse 42. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the savior of the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Friends, this is why we can put our trust in Jesus. He will will never, he will never call us to do something that, that which he has not already done. And in fact, he then empowers us to do it by the power of the Spirit. So anyway, he says, look, the Holy Spirit's coming, he's going to empower you. And when that happened, we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, that Christ's followers literally turned the world upside down. They turned the world upside down. Imagine that. Imagine that being said about your local church. Imagine that being said about the churches in Lagos, the churches in Nigeria, the churches in West Africa, that they were so in love with Jesus and the mission, they literally turned this region upside down. Friends, I I don't know how we could be boring with such a mission. Pastor Jeremiah said it, that we are on the greatest adventure of our lives. They turn the world upside down in some of the most creative and innovative ways. You go read the book of Acts, some of the most creative and innovative ways the people of God, on the mission of God, by the power of God. We are missionally creative and innovative. We just are. We are missionally creative and innovative disciples of Jesus on mission for the glory of God. You've got to believe that about yourself. How can we be boring? One of my favorite Uh, pastors in our city, he he likes to say this. He says, we must be careful that we don't become individuals who are delivering mail to an address that no longer exists. We're delivering mail, and the content of our mail is brilliant. It's brilliant. It's amazing. It, It changes lives. The Word of God changes and transforms lives. So uh, the content of our mail is incredible. But, but the problem is, I think for many of us, we're trying to deliver this to addresses that don't exist anymore. The addresses of 10, 15, 20, 100 years ago. And then we, we're wondering, why is nothing happening? It's because there's no one there. We are missionally creative and innovative disciples of Jesus on mission for the glory of God. Friends, I I believe one of the best missionaries out there, we read about him in the scriptures, was Paul the Apostle. And Paul knew this. Paul the Apostle knew this. This is why I believe he said to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, he says this, I have become all things to all people so that I may, that I may, by every possible means, save some. 
I have become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. Not so, not so that I might be able to build a platform for myself. That's not what it says. Not so that I might be, become famous, that I might have millions of followers on Instagram. That's, that's not what it says. It says, so that I may by every possible means save some. Pastor Jeremiah said it. Be one, make some. Be one, make some. The Apostle Paul is fully aware of the calling, fully aware of the fact that he has been consecrated, fully aware of the mission. And because he's aware of those things, he knew it would have required him to change elements of his approach when needed. He would have to change elements of his approach when needed to be creative and innovative when needed. Let me read you the whole context. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 19, it says this, Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why? In order to win more people. The mission. He says in verse 20, To the Jews, I became like a Jew. Why, Paul? To win Jews, the mission, to those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself not under the law, why? To win those under the law. Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, you know what, if it means that I need to become like some of those boring people who sit around in rooms, that's all they do. They sit around in rooms and and discuss these big theological concepts and argue with one another. Are you A-mill? Are you pre-mill? Are you post-mill? He goes, you know what, it's okay, I will. So that I might win some. Some of you are sitting here going, did he say post-mill, pre-mill? Is he, is he talking about being a millionaire? Can I be mill-? Like, what, what are you talking about? If you don't know, you are one of the lucky ones. He says, I'll do it. If it means that we can win some. Verse 21, to, to those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law, the mission. To the weak I became weak. Why would anybody want to be weak? In the world that we live in today, why? It's all about, no, I've got to put on this posture of I'm in control, I'm in power, I know what's going on. Why would anybody want to be weak? Well, Paul says, I'll do it. If you mean it gets me an opportunity to be around those who are weak, Hey, what do we need to do to be creative and innovative to be around the weak? We'll do it. Why? So that we might win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. And then he says in verse 23, now I do all this because of the gospel. That's important so that I may share in the blessings. I want to share a little story about uh, my wife. Um, Incredible, incredible woman. And a couple of years ago, she felt God was saying, hey, we live in an area where there's a lot of prostitution. There are these young girls that are are, are being taken from the villages, brought to the city um, with promises that that, that they'll they'll find jobs and they'll be able to go to school and so forth, but then they get hooked on drugs and then they find themselves in a life of prostitution. And so my wife says, you know what? I believe God's called me to mission. There's a reason that we live here, literally, literally a street away. So I'm going to go spend some of my evenings with them. I'm going to simply just build friendship, build relationships. Now, now you can imagine, we lived at the church. The church was literally a block away from where all of this was happening. There was a flat on the church. And, and so there were the, the community that came to the church, they were in that area. I, imagine one of them driving by and seeing my wife 
and going, and then? You know when you do that quick reverse? Because it's dark, it's at night, and you're like, you pull out your phone and you put on the torch. Is that conflict? No, it can't be. I have become all things. It's, it's, not about, it's not about what other people think about me. Now, again, he says here it's for the gospel. But it's not about what other people think about me. Look, I, I do everything to the praise of the audience of one. When I show up and I open up God's word, look, some people will like it, some people won't. Some people will fall asleep. Some people will be like, this is incredible. And, and praise be to God that he uses this. But you know what? I want to glorify him and him alone. The audience of one. And so when you think about your mission, you, you might go, but you know, what are people going to think about me? Like, are they going to think he's not really serious about his faith? Are they going to, hey, what does God think about you? What does God think about your local church, about your ministry? Now, let me be clear. Let me be very clear. What this does not mean is that we are to compromise with the world in order to fit in. I have become all things. Many times has been misunderstood as Paul is giving the church an excuse to live ungodly, worldly lives with the hope that unconverted sinners will be impressed with us and then they'll want to come to Christ. That's not how it works. They don't look at us and go, oh, wow, you're a Christian, and he's at the party getting drunk. Yeah, maybe I'll give my life to Christ. I've never heard that before in my life. Never. Amen. Oh, oh he's, but he sings in the choir, and he's sleeping around with a bunch of girls, and we're all fully aware of this. Oh, okay, yeah, no, then, then Christ is very appealing. What Paul is saying is we must never compromise God's word, but we should be willing to skip, change, alter, modify, adjust traditions and practices that we all have. And maybe, let me, can I go a little bit deeper here? Just a little bit. Let's be honest. I know we call them traditions and practices. But in all fairness, for many of those, they are actually comforts. They're comforts. And, and when they get in the way of us worshiping Jesus for who he is and being on mission, the mission that he has called us, you know what they become? They become sacred cows. They become idols in our lives. And the Bible is clear. The Bible tells us that we're to demolish idols. And so my question to you is what are some of the idols that you need to demolish in your life, in your ministry, or in your church? Things that you have labeled as biblical, but they're just preferences. They're just practices. And for many of them, they are outdated. You're sitting here and you're going, no, no, we do this because we've been doing it for the last 50 years. Is that your reason? That's not a good enough reason. The reason is we're doing this because we believe that this is the most strategic and creative and innovative way to reach people in our neighborhood. Not because so-and-so said we must do it and if we do something different, then so-and-so is gonna be very upset. Let him be upset. This will get us in hot water. It surely has for us. Pursuing the mission by being creative and innovative and asking difficult questions about some of the ways that we do things has gotten us in some hot water where people are going, I don't know if One is really a Christian. We, we had a guy, we had a guy, let me tell you a story. We had a guy who, who he's now part of our church, he's plugged in, him and his wife and their kids, they're amazing, um, they're, they're in our band, but, but, but the first three, four Sundays, he struggled every time he came to Rooted Fellowship. 
Because he, he would show up and, and he, he'd experience everything that we're doing. And every time something happened, he'd go, aha, they're Pentecostal. And then something would happen and they'd go, okay, no, they're not. And then we all go, they're Baptist. And then something would happen, they'd be like, okay, no, no, they're, they're not. And so I heard Pastor Femi say yesterday, we've heard from a Baptist, we've heard from a Pentecostal. To be honest, I don't know what I am. I have become all things. So you can call me whatever, Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist. What, like for me, I'm just going, what, what is the most effective way without compromising the gospel to reach people? We'll do that. It'll get you in some hot water. It got Paul into some hot water. Paul was accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple. His second arrest was because of that. How dare he bring Gentiles into the temple? Simply because he was preaching the gospel and saying, hey, in Jesus, his death and resurrection has divided, destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. That means there's no longer Jew and Gentile. Pastor Femi alluded to it, you see, uh, and, and much of the world is this way. We share the gospel, and the Jewish people come to faith, share the gospel, Gentile people come to faith. It's so easy to just start a Jewish church, start a Gentile church, this thing becomes a mega church, and then it's all about the planter. Yep. Paul goes, nope, Jewish people, Gentile people, one family. If you read... The letters, yes, a lot of what Paul addresses is theological errors and, and, and where they miss the boat on the gospel. A lot of it is that. But if you read carefully, a lot of it is about food, holidays, what you wear. Like that's what he's addressing. Why? Be because Jewish people were going, hey, we don't eat pork. And we love Jesus, but hey, we don't eat pork. It's part of our tradition. It's part of our practice. Gentile people going, hey, we cover everything with pork. <laughs> We've even made it into a seasoning and we just spread it. It would be like jollof and pork seasoning on it. And so he's having to address this and say, guys, the, the, gosp the gospel, the gospel, because one of the most beautiful pictures of the gospel is when people from all walks of life come together. One Lord. We heard it from Chris last night. One Lord. One hope, one baptism, this, this oneness. It got Paul into some hot water. So it begs the question, why would Paul do this? Why? Well, it's because I believe he had the same heart and passion that Jesus had. Jump with me to Matthew chapter 9, a fairly well-known piece of scripture. It tells us Jesus and his ministry. And remember, I have become, what did Jesus do? Fully God became fully man. There is no better, more beautiful picture of I have become than Jesus himself putting on flesh. Do, do, do you know how humbling that is? The creator of everything saying, you know what, I'm going to cry like a baby and be so defenseless and crawl around on the ground. Why? So that I might win some. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. I'll run through this real quick. The text tells us, Jesus continued going around all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. He went around all the towns, all the villages. This is, speaks of the fact that Jesus went everywhere. He just went everywhere. He was like, I just want people to, to, to hear of the kingdom. Teaching in the synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. We've already heard it. He's teaching in the synagogues this transformation, discipleship. You could put it that way. He's preaching the good news of the kingdom, conversion. He's telling people to repent and believe, healing every disease and every sickness, signs and wonders. Our mission requires all of it. Verse 35 tells us what Jesus did. Verse 36 tells us why. And this is important. If you want to be creative and innovative in your mission, this is important. Verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. 
He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected. The NIV and ESV translation says it this way, they were harassed and helpless. The New King James Version says it this way, they were weary and scattered. The message says that they were confused and aimless. This is all of us before we come to Christ. And we can pretend and perform. We can put on our best suits and our best dresses. But without Christ, that is you. That is you. And this is what Jesus sees. He sees a crowd of people who are battered and bruised and distorted and ripped apart and worn out and exhausted. Not just physically, but spiritually, where it matters the most. You know, I, I hear people pray sometimes, and I, I would hear them and I'd go, I think you need to be careful about what you're praying. One of them is, fire, come down, Lord, come I'm like, well, are you serious? Just calm down a little bit on that one. I don't think you fully understand. Like, are you able, are you ready? Are you, that's one. The other one is, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. <laughs> if, if God answers that, Think about that for a moment. Break my heart for what breaks you. You know what breaks God's heart? This. Because when, if, if he breaks your heart, he'll open your eyes. And when you start to see your neighbors and your, your colleagues and your friends and your family members, the way that Jesus sees them, I don't know how you cannot be on mission. I don't know how you cannot be creative and innovative on mission. I, I don't get it. The text tells us that Jesus was filled with compassion. You know, the English language fails us many times. It, it fails us a lot of times. And, and here it has failed us. You see, in the Greek, the, this word compassion is splach nizome. I know you like that one. I know. Some of you are like, how do you spell that? I, I'm going to use it tonight. Um, <laughs> splach I mean, just, just the way that you say it, you, you, there's intention there. Spl compassion. <laughs> Jesus had compassion. Splach nizome. You see, in the Greek, it means to be deeply moved, to be affected in one's inner being. I, I could tell a story I could, uh, about when this happened. Oh, well, I'll be very brief. Uh, two, about two years ago, uh, we had just started our sabbatical, our family, and, and my, 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 I wake up in the morning to the, the cry of my wife. I was upstairs, she was downstairs, and, and she cries out to me, and I could hear that this wasn't a normal cry. This wasn't a, you left the towels on the bathroom floor. It, was, it wasn't one of those. It was like a serious cry, and she was saying, something is wrong with our youngest daughter. So I rush downstairs, and I see her. She's in a, my wife's arms, and she's, she's shaking. She's like shaking a lot, and, and she's not really engaging with us. We're calling out her name, but she's not engaging her eyes and looking up and I go what on earth is going on I go back upstairs grab my car keys change as quickly as I can run downstairs grab my daughter get in the car no seatbelt and make my way to the hospital our youngest daughter was having seizures I get there now it's COVID and everyone's trying to do uh, protocols and so uh, what's your name what <laughs> medical aid card are you sick are you sick like I was ready I was I was ready Eventually, we get a bed for her, and I'm, I'm, she's lying on me because I'm like, there's no ways I'm letting go of my daughter. And they like, plug all these things in her, and eventually she settles down. But, but here's the thing. In that moment, in that moment, I was so deeply moved by the condition of my, my daughter that I was willing to trade places with her. If you knew what I was saying, I wouldn't have to preach as long. I was willing to trade places with her. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, the thing is this. I was willing to trade places with her, but I cannot do what only Jesus can do. Friends, friends, you want to be creative and innovative in mission. We gotta pray that that we would have compassion, that we would have splach nizome for our communities, for our workplaces, 
for our families, for our, our cities and, and our villages and our country and our region and our continent and the world. Splachnizome. And I can't trade places with my neighbor, but you know what? I know someone who did. And I will be creative and innovative as much as I can so that you would hear the good news of the gospel and then I'll pray in expectation that God would do something. Friends, I believe if we had splachnizome, we would be more creative and innovative in reaching our Muslim neighbors. I wish I, wish, I, wish I knew how. I, I, I'm waiting to learn from you, to be honest. Our context isn't like yours, and I'm waiting to learn from you. We'd be more creative and innovative if we had splachnizome. We'd reach our children in, I'm telling you, phenomenal ways. And we have the opportunity to put on display how to reach the children. Africa is the youngest continent in terms of the, the age of, of its people. We're the youngest continent in the world. So right here we have an opportunity to put on display what it looks like to be creative and missional as we engage them. If we had Splachnizo, may we be creative and missional, innovative in reaching the nominal Christian. Because here's the reality. If we don't, all three of those people in that group, they're all going to hell. I don't know if we feel the seriousness of that. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that are going to hell. Because we're too comfortable in our practices and our traditions. We're not willing to question them. We're not willing to see them for what they are as idols that need to be demolished. And so, why are we transcultural? Well, it's because I want people to hear the good news of Jesus and to come to faith. Why do we do question of the day? Why do we add an additional 10 to 12, 15 minutes to our gathering? Because I want people to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Why do we do an eat and run? The logistics of that alone is a nightmare. I'd rather just be at home with my family and watch TV and show up on Sunday and open up God's word and preach. But you know what? I'll do it time and time again. Why? Because I want people to come to know Jesus is Lord and Savior. And so while I may not have tools and practices, and uh, I can share with, with you what we're doing, I would rather ask that God would spark in you a compassion, a compassion for the lost. Because when that happens, I'm telling you, someone will come and share great ideas, but you know what? They'll be like, mm, it's good. Praise Jesus for what he's doing. But we're going to go come up with creative and innovative ways to reach people. I'll close with this. Verse 37 of Matthew 9 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers out into the harvest, into his harvest. He's telling us that, guys, the opportunity is there. It's there. It's ready. The issue is us. We're the issue. We're too comfortable in our practices and our traditions. We're way too comfortable. Way too comfortable. Way too comfortable. I want to close in a prayer. This prayer is not mine comes from the scriptures. Paul prays to the church in Ephesus. It's his second prayer. I'm going to pray this for us. Because I believe, I believe that the church in Lagos, the church in Nigeria, the, the church in West Africa, the church on this continent can, can really do some amazing things. I live in expectation of that. Not because we're tied to practices and traditions and systems and the way we used to do things, but rather because we are tied to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in Him. And because we are in Him, we have this deep compassion. This deep compassion to see people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
It's not about sitting and trying to come up with creative. Like, you know when you're at the end of your, your like, I have nothing more to give that's creative and innovative. I just, I don't know. Then, then stop praying for creative and innovative ideas and stop praying for God to give you this deep compassion. This splach nizo, because I'm telling you. When that hits you, all of a sudden you're going, but how? How can we? How? All of a sudden you're going, I'm going to, to, to lunch with my friend, and, and I know this weight, I've been coming here for years, and, and, and we're going we're gonna to pray for our meal, we're going to do something that we always do, but you know what? I'm going to ask the waiter, hey, we're about to pray for our meal right now. Is there anything that we can pray for you? I don't know what, I don't know what that could open up in conversation. Maybe we change our language. You know what, at Rooted Fellowship, we, we, we don't say believers and unbelievers. Why? Because most people believe in something. So when you say uh, believers, they're going, yeah, I'm a believer, I believe in something. So we've gone, okay, hold on, we, we need to be creative and, and innovative to make sure that people are hearing the gospel. Like, what is, God, I'm, because these people keep showing up, they're nominal Christians. They think they are safe, but they're not. Distressed and dejected. And so here's my prayer. Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14, it says this. Paul writes, for this reason, the, the, he's just unpacked the, the, the fact that God is using the local church as his vehicle to put on display his manifold wisdom. He's so blown away by that, that God would use us you and me. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he says, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, Oh, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.